For over 100 years, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach has been serving Iowans. As our state recovers from COVID-19, we will continue to deliver information and education based on research to help you care for your family, manage stress, and support your community, your business, and your farm. We're here for you now, and we will be for the next 100 years. Together, we will build a strong Iowa. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. I feel like this was a week that every day I thought was Friday and then was rudely reminded it wasn't. But we are here. It is Friday and it's sunny out, at least coming from Iowa State campus. It is sunny here. Uh, we are going to talk gardening, guys. We did it. We did it. It's springtime. Okay, so today we have two amazing guests with us that you have seen before. It's been a, it's been a little while, though. The wintertime um, put us in a bit of a hibernation, gardening-wise. All right, so we've got Susan DeBleek with us, Master Gardener Program Coordinator. Welcome. Hey, Leah. I'm Glad to have you. I'm super excited about gardening, and not going to lie, the last dream I was having this morning, I was telling somebody, I really love plants. <laughs> I just want to plant. Just let That's me true. plant. I um, am married to an avid outdoorsman, gardener, et cetera, et cetera. So I get to reap all the benefits. Um, and I, I don't I don't have to do quite as much work, um, but he loves it. So I just, I'm there having iced tea or whatever, supporting him and reaping all the uh, tasty treats that come. Uh, we also have Ajay with us and he is live from the greenhouse. So we're going to like real life. This is it. Hello, Good morning. <laughs> Do you still have a few um, students working amongst you? Oh, yeah. Uh, we are actually today uh, starting an experiment which is focusing on the growing medium and uh, trying to optimize that growing medium for vegetable transplant production. So uh, over the last, I would say, two to three weeks, uh, things have really, uh, you know, in action here in the greenhouse. So yeah. we're happy to join you all from here. So exciting. And I, this is one thing I feel like in the last couple of years of working closely with, well, with you guys, that when I hear growing medium, I now know what that means. Cause previously I was like, I wonder what that is, but it's like the, the soil or the, what's being used at the yeah. root. Yeah. So in the greenhouses typically, or when you buy uh, transplants from any of your you know garden shops, uh, they don't use the regular soil to grow the seedling. Mm they use the growing medium, uh, which is soilless. There is no soil in it. And it is primarily composed of uh, peat, uh, perlite, and sometimes vermiculite. So that's the, that's the growing medium. Well, I've already laid the groundwork that there is no uh, question that cannot be asked. It, those of you that know your way around the garden, um, welcome. Those of you that want to know more, you are safe here. Um, all right, so today's Topics are really focused on seed starting, and Ajay already kind of talked a little about transplanting, and he's going to give us a lot more on that. Um, and then also looking forward to some of that spring gardening, what's what's happening now, what's going to be happening. Um, and I'm going to hop off the screen here. Susan and I are actually going to hop off, and we're going to we're going to give Ajay full reins, and he's going to give us an awesome tutorial, some information. We're going to see it live in action. What's going on in the greenhouse? Um, dreaming of days when it feels as warm as it probably does in that greenhouse. Well, thank you very much, Leah. Thanks, Susan, and welcome, everyone. Uh, again, this is a beautiful day here at Iowa State campus, and I believe uh, the weather we experienced last week definitely made all of us wear our you know, <laughs> gardening boots and pants and just be out there to, to plant. So <laughs> this next week is a little cold, but you know, anything above 32 is good for us. Uh, so today I'm here at the uh, ISU Horticulture uh, Research Greenhouses, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, transplant production of how to start your seedlings, uh, show you some examples. Uh, you can see in my, behind me, we have already started lettuce in the greenhouse. There's some tomato transplants out there. Today we are planting uh, seeding peppers, so I'll talk briefly about that experiment. Uh, but primarily the topic would be how to uh, grow successfully a good quality transplant. So uh, the first thing I would like to bring to everybody's attention is we all need to start with good quality seed. You know, I always say this, uh, uh, seeds don't cost, they actually pay. Because if you have good quality seed, 
uh, you'll have a good quality plant that will produce uh, well, will have disease resistance package, will be having fruits of higher quality. So the whole gardening experience is worth it. You know, you have put so much time and effort in, in uh, setting up your garden, establishing a garden. So start with good quality seeds. Uh, you, there are several seed vendors, you know, they come in bags like these. Uh, uh, some seeds uh, uh, are, you know, uh, coated or pelleted, uh, which means they put clay on top of them. Uh, that's just uh, for uh, easy seeding if you are if you have many to seed and uh, easy singularity sometimes uh, you know for commercial production we use uh, a transplanter so we need you know, separate seeds uh, some of the seeds might even come coated with fungicides so i have some in my hand here i hope you can see this is like a silverish color so these are pepper seeds that are uh, coated with fungicide. So when you work with them, please be careful. Maybe use gloves uh, so that you don't get the fungicide on them. The reason uh, there are fungicides uh, because um, uh, it, it provides uh, protection from fungus. But most of the seeds which are catered to the homeowners uh, are usually either pelletized or there are no fungicides on it. But again, start with good quality seeds. So once you have bought your seeds, you need to think about, OK, uh, what is the growing medium? Uh, where am I going to seed these uh, uh, these seeds which you bought of different plants? So uh, typically, uh, you can either use a six pack, which is more commonly available. Um, in our case here, I'm going to show you a flat here. Uh, that way, you get an idea of uh, how we are seeding here. This is more for commercial purposes. So you can see here is a flat. This was a 72 cell flat. Uh, which I cut into uh, half, so these are, there are 36 cells in here, and then I, I filled my growing medium in there, and I'll talk about the growing medium in, in just a minute. But you can seed in these flats, so, so that's easy to do. Uh, they can, as I said, they come in six packs too, so you can have six seeds in a pack, and it's easy to move around. Uh, you don't have to use bigger uh, flats, or you can uh, even use uh, soil blocks. So this is something unique and new, and many organic growers do that, is they uh, uh, create blocks of soil. Uh, it's not even soil, actually. It's a mix of, you know, again, perlite, vermiculite, uh, uh, peat. And I'm going to show you a soil block here with the seedling in it. You can see this has no plastic, nothing on it. This was, the soil block was made with a soil block maker. Uh, you can buy it on Johnny's, that's where we bought it from. Uh, and then in that, we put a, a seed, and this is the tomato seedling that is coming through it. So this is about two and a half, three week old, three week old seedling actually, two eggs, three. So this is a soil block, so you can start your seedling like that. But you know, I feel like uh, more commonly you'll be getting a six pack, a plastic six pack, which is totally fine. Uh, we need to, uh, once you have that flat, now you need to think about what is the growing medium you want to use. So. Here, for our research, we can formulate different types of uh, growing mixes. We can mix different proportions of peat, perlite, which is that white colored you know, uh, material which you see in your soilless mixes. We can use perlite, and we can use vermiculite. That's another one. Uh, but for a homeowner uh, uh, situation, and even for large scale gardening, you can just buy a regular soilless mix. Uh, they come in these big, big bags. Uh, two liter bags or two cubic feet bags. Uh, and uh, any any soilless mix would do. You know, uh, Scott's Pro is a company that sells a lot of that. And there might be other companies out in the market. But what you're looking for is a soilless mix. And what it primarily has, it has peat and it has uh, perlite. And the reason for having peat is to hold moisture and perlite to provide more drainage and aeration in that medium. So, so once you have decided your growing medium, you fill that in your flats and you raise your seedlings. So when you raise your seedlings, what comes into your mind? What does a seedling need to grow? So there are three major things. One is, the, is it needs light. So you need to make sure you put your seedlings uh, in a place where there is at least 10 to 12 hours of light. So some people would start in their basement. That's totally fine. Make sure it's in a facing a window, south facing window where there is direct sun hitting it if possible. If you don't have access to such a window, you can use artificial light. So many of our homeowners or many of our growers, you know, gardeners might use fluorescent lamp, totally fine. You can use a fluorescent lamp. 
Just make sure that the fluorescent lamp is pretty close to your seedling as the seedling is growing. The fluorescent lamp should not be like two feet above from the tray or the flat where the seeds are. So you need to keep it close to the seedling. And if it's a fluorescent lamp, you can keep it as close as three to four inches away from it. So that will be ideal. In our case, again, we are in the research greenhouses. You can see above me, uh, these are high pressure sodium lamps. And we have multiple of them in the greenhouse. So uh, we, we maintain a very high light intensity because this is for research and we have the facility to do that. Uh, and so the quality will be better. The more light the plants get, the quality will be better. So light is the first factor. Second, water. So your seedlings, when you, when you have seeded, uh, they need water. So make sure you water regularly. Uh, one of the mistakes or, or uh, challenges which I see out there is sometimes we overwater. We put too much water, like every day. You, you seed it today and starting today, every day you are watering. I think that's not a good approach because what happens is every time you are watering, you are removing the oxygen from the, from the medium. And if the medium always says wet and super saturated, the roots are not going to grow that well. So uh, once you seed, uh, water immediately and maybe another one day after one day check if it's drying down a little bit apply a little bit water so a little bit at a time just to give that media a little bit time to dry out maybe less time to dry out when they're just emerging but once they've emerged when the seedlings are out there you need to uh, cut back on the watering such that you give some time for the media to dry not completely dry a little bit dry so don't over water so uh, and then air third thing is air and that's why when you regulate your watering efficiently and properly uh, there will be enough air in the growing medium for the seedlings to grow so i will give you an example i'm going to pull uh, uh, another soil block from here so we can see the seedling again as i said this is three week old tomato seedling it's doing great uh, i can even see some white roots at the bottom i don't know if you can see it very clearly but i see some white roots and, and this is a very healthy transplant at a three week stage. Uh, this is from the soil block. If I want to pull uh, something uh, from, the, uh, from the growing medium, uh, from the flat, I'm gonna do that quickly. So you have an idea. Here you go. And you see that white uh, roots in that growing medium. That is an indicator that the roots are healthy and they're growing really, really well. So you don't need root, you don't want to see roots that are brown or or dark in color because that shows that there was too much of moisture. So white roots, you can see that here. So that's a good indicator again. This is a three week old tomato transplant. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, you know, just to talk about uh, the experiment which we are conducting here, I showed you two of the transplants. We are comparing uh, growing transplants in, in black plastic flats versus uh, growing them uh, in the soil block. So we have different treatments, we are testing uh, different growing mediums, so uh, some from the commercial companies uh, that are available and some we formulated ourselves with different proportions of peat and uh, vermiculite and perlite and also a little bit of compost. Uh, that's another thing I would uh, say uh, that if you have access to good quality compost, please feel free to go ahead and add it to your growing medium. Just make sure that you don't add more than 25% of the volume of your medium. Uh, to be compost. So I, I try to keep the compost at 25 or less percent of the entire medium, and that will be excellent. Again, good quality compost. Not all composts are made equal. Uh, so if the compost was not composting, was not done properly, that's a poor quality compost, and it can hurt your seedlings. So make sure you get good quality compost, and you can supplement about 25 percent of the growing medium. Could be compost. That gives many benefits, you know, nutrients, water holding capacity, and it also populates uh, the rooting zone with good microbial uh, or microbial population. So, so that's, that's good. So uh, finally, I showed you tomato. We have some lettuce seedlings out here. You can see they are mo planted more closely because lettuce seedlings are in the flats for a shorter amount of time. And that's the final thing I want to mention. When you grow transplants, uh, each transplant needs a specific amount of time. Uh, the seedlings need a specific amount of time to be in the greenhouse. After that, they, are, they have to be transplanted. So in the case of tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, the, the time it takes to grow from the seed to a to size of a plant that can be transplanted is anywhere from six to eight weeks. Commercially, if you have light and all that, we can do it in maybe five to seven weeks. But that's the typical amount of time for those plants, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. 
uh, in the case of broccoli, cold crops, you know, cauliflower, it takes about four to five weeks uh, to, to get to a good quality transplant. In the, case of in the case of lettuce, again, about four weeks to grow the transplant. Uh, in the case of cucurbits, now we are talking about melons, watermelon, squash. They don't take four weeks. They, might, they don't take five or six weeks. You should be uh, ready to transplant within three to four weeks because the more you keep them in the flat, uh, the more the roots will grow. And when you pull them out and you transplant, those plants don't like their roots to be disturbed too much. So please make sure you don't put them, grow them as a transplant for more than four weeks. Three to four weeks, great, and you can transplant after that. So each tran transplant has different, each uh, vegetable has different number of days for its transplants to grow. So uh, I hope you, uh, I was able to provide you with some good tips and, and show you around in the greenhouse and how we are growing our transplants and getting ready for an exciting research year outside. I hope COVID will sub subside, we'll all get our vaccinations and we'll be out there you know, in full swing uh, gardening. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Leah and Susan. Woo! My fingers were going fast and furious trying to keep up with you. There's so much good information. We did have a couple questions come in, so let's get to those before we move on to chatting about some other gardening information. Well, first and foremost, we had a few people that were just like, yay, finally. And I think that was in reference to it's time. It's time, guys. Um, yeah, you said last week's weather definitely caused all of us to start like, I threw my windows open. It was like 42 degrees and I was like, it's warm. <laughs> like, you know, you live in Iowa when? All right, so we had a question about germination. Is there a difference in germination between a hot pepper plant versus a bell pepper plant? So uh, there could be differences in like few days, but overall it's the same time it will take to germinate. I would say not germinate and also to establish it as a good transplant. So uh, peppers are usually up, you know, day seven, day 10. So it will be the same. And the time it takes to grow the transplant is anywhere from five to seven weeks provided you have enough light, you provided water. And, and one more thing which I, I should have mentioned is fertility. We need to make sure while we are growing our seedlings, we need to fertilize them. We need to provide the fertilizer or the nutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the potassium. So the compost can do that, uh, the, the amount of compost you added, but that won't be enough in the medium. So you need to supplement that with either uh, you know, synthetic fertilizer. You can buy a 10, 10, 10 or a 20, 20, 20 from, from any gardening store or, or, or you know, uh, 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 let's say uh, Loves or um, any, uh, Menards or any other place. Uh, uh, and if you, do, if you want to grow it organically, there are organic uh, fertilizers available as well. You know, fish emulsion is something that is very common. So you can use that hmm. as well. All right. Um, then we also had uh, any suggestions on a, a best container for seedlings? Yeah, it's a tricky question because it depends on how many plants you are growing. So in our case, you know, I showed you, we, we transplant in like 72 cell flat, 98 cell flat, because we need that many plants outside, or maybe four times of that, because this is a replicated trial. But let's say if you have only 10 tomato plants you're growing, I would seed them in a six pack. You can buy a six pack, which has you know six, uh, about an inch, inch and a half wide, you know, uh, uh, square blocks. And so they come in a pack of six. So you, get, you have enough media in there and you can see it in there and grow your transplant all the way till the end in there. So a six pack would do if you are not planting more than let's say 20 plants or so. But if you need, if you're planting more, if you're either growing it for a community garden or you are sharing it with friends and, and, uh, and, and folks around you, uh, maybe in that case you might want to look at a bigger flat and these flat come in different sizes, 50 cell flat, 72 cell flat, 98 cell flat. So on an average, a 72 cell flat will be good, uh, but for plants that are not grown for a longer amount of time as a transplant, for example, squash, watermelon, muskmelon, I would use a 50 cell flat so that there is more media in there. Awesome. All right, and we've got a small broccoli story. Before we go and to broccoli, can I? Is really strong. Oh, you wanna to add to that? Uh, I'll take this one off. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to ask Ajay, so some seeds are really tiny, and when we put them in the six pack, it's like, oh, I'll just put in a few more. So um, 
and anything about how many seeds, like if we have a six pack, how many seeds um, should we be putting in each cell? Sure, good question, uh, Susan. So if it's tomato, pepper, eggplant, uh, let even, even cabbage, cauliflower, I'll just put one seed. Um, hmm. uh, sometimes, okay, now I should be, I, I should be careful. So uh, in case, let's say you are having experiences with seedlings emerging and there is, you know, you have some kind of pest or something chew away your seedling. It, sometimes it happens in the greenhouse. There are some uh, notorious cockroaches around here that love oh. to chew the seedlings. <laughs> so sometimes what we do is we seed two in each cell. And when they have emerged, then we will go and cut one because then we only have, so because we only need one in that uh, block. So mm -hmm. you can see two and later on thin them to have just one. I'm, I'm thinking of times where I have tried to start seeds and laughing because I am the person that's like, look at these baby seeds, dump. Uh, <laughs> so that is a good. And then when you see which one's coming up, I guess when you're cutting, are you looking at is one seeming to be stronger, larger than the exactly. other? Exactly. Okay. Which are looking stronger. The, the challenge is, let's say if you put two or three, those seedlings are all wanting to eat the nutrients in the medium and use the light. They get crowded. Mm -hmm. So the quality will be really poor on all three. So for it's better to put one, one have one in each cell. Perfect. Okay, now we'll go to my uh, to the sad broccoli story. Um, every time that she's starting her broccoli, it starts off very strong and then ends up kind of flopping to the side. Um, is it not getting enough light, or what can I do to improve this? So the the, the way it sounds like, definitely light could be an issue uh, because these plants, you know, uh, they need a about 10 to 12 hours of direct sunlight, you know, in order to you know, grow well. Uh, also, uh, um, I would suggest uh, Lauren to uh, keep up with the uh, fertilization, you know, making sure you apply the uh, nutrients regularly, you know, once a week. And the amount that you need to apply, you don't need to be very technical like how we do exact amounts of parts per million of nitrogen. You can use what's on the box. Uh, 20, 20, 20 or a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer will tell you, take this many scoops and put in one gallon and water. So just do that, you know, on a weekly basis, once the seeds have germinated. So maybe starting two weeks after seeding, I think those two factors would, would definitely help uh, to raise a good quality seedling or transplant. And do you think there's anything to do with dampening off with that one? Okay, so uh, Susan brings in a good point. Uh, you know, she's, uh, Lauren mentioned about it kind of, uh, you know, flopping. Uh, what I would do is, uh, if it's not because of light or if it's not because of fertility issues, you might want to pull the root, like pull one plant out and look at the root system. And if the roots don't have those white color to them, then there is a disease, and which is uh, primarily a disease uh, ca caused by pythium, like a disease uh, issue caused by pythium. It's called the uh, pythium um, uh, soft rot, or it could be the damping off. So, uh, uh, and that brings me back to the first point I mentioned, buy good quality seeds. Uh, so buy seeds from uh, register, like, uh, vendors you know of who are reputable. And if, you, and if you're using your own seeds, and if you had issues in your plants last year, I would not use the same batch of seeds because that might carry over to the seeds. Mm. So, so Susan brings in a very good point to make sure you use good quality seeds and maybe pull that plant out and see what the roots are. If it's dampening off, obviously it's a disease issue. Awesome. Okay, I think we're going to jump into, um, we have a few slides put together with just some really good reminders as well as just some, you know, key things to keep at the top of your brain when you're going into garden mode, which we're, I think we're all there. Um, so let's move on into that. Um, and then again, keep asking your questions, whether it's on the topic we're talking about or it's something else coming to mind. Um, this is your moment, guys. You don't want to pass up having Ajay and Susan right here. Um, at your fingertips. So ask your questions or share things maybe that have worked well for you. So I'm gonna hand it over to you guys to get some uh, some more tips out. Sure, so I'll take the lead and uh, with Ajay as my co-pilot, I know that this this will go a little bit better. Um, so I'm Susan DeBleek, I coordinate the Master Gardener program and um, the Master Gardener volunteers do a lot of different things. One thing they might do is grow vegetables in their community. And personally, 
among all the plants, I've got the most experience with vegetables. I'm not a pro, um, but I can walk you all through a few seed starting and spring gardening tips. So Ajay was already talking about, you know, get high quality seeds, make sure you're purchasing seeds from a respected retailer. And he also talked about the germination medium, that this is soilless and that air is a really important component when seeds are germinating. Um, and then in terms of containers, we did get a question about what type of containers. Ajay talked about the, the six pack um, container if you're, if you're um, starting a small garden. And to me, um, lights are optional. Uh, they're definitely helpful. And like Ajay said, the transplants need a lot of light. And so if you don't have good light, it seems like cheap lights are becoming more and more available. And I've even seen little stands so that the light can be really close to the transplant because you don't want them leaning up towards that window and um, falling over. Do you want to add anything to that, Ajay? No, I think you, you made a very good point. Uh, if it's a fluorescent source, keep the source closer to the plant so they can get all the the photons <laughs> that the light is emitting or the tube is emitting. Perfect. Yeah. And then next, uh, a few tips about getting started. Start small. I know every year we have so much hope and so much optimism and then reality sets in. So just start with something small. Uh, and then in terms of the best location, thankfully we have some incredible soils in Iowa. And for me, a good location is thinking about light. So trying to be farther away from trees. And I know on a recent Hort Day on Iowa Public Radio, folks were talking about black walnut trees and how those can um, cause some real problems for vegetable gardens. So um, making, making choices about your location in terms of sunshine, and then also making sure it's convenient for you. Um, plant, plant your vegetables close to where you're already going to be. Don't put them really far away so that they'll, they'll get forgotten about. And then considering the mature size of plants, it's really easy to forget when we see the seed packet and we see that tiny tomato seed that tomato plants can get six feet, eight feet tall. Ajay, how big have you seen them? Yeah, I mean, some of the indeterminate ones will keep growing. <laughs> so yeah. Very tall. You need to trellis them. <laughs> These plants get huge. And I feel like every time that I start my vegetable garden, I forget about that. And I think, oh, you know, there's that cell container. I'll add more seeds or there's a mound, I'll add more seeds, but really these plants or even a zucchini plant, like these plants get really big. So keep that in mind. And then we like to uh, encourage everybody to get a soil test and to learn more about your soil and to do that often. And in terms of what type of crops to grow, think about what you actually like to eat. Uh, for me personally, I, I like eating tomatoes. I love kale. I definitely use them a lot in the kitchen. Um, and I'm happy to buy onions at the farmer's market. So next we're going to talk about the easy to grow vegetables. And um, the first one that I'll talk about maybe is potatoes. So this, this spring, the potatoes in your pantry are probably sprouting and that's a good thing. Pretty soon you can start cutting them into little chunks and you can find a five gallon bucket or even a bigger container and put those little pieces in some soil and add more and more soil. And later this summer, you can dump out the bucket and it might be full of potatoes. Um, so that's a really easy crop to grow. I know there are loads of jokes in Iowa about growing zucchini and summer squash because they can be prolific. My sad story last year, I all of my zucchini plants failed. <laughs> so I benefited from other people's generosity. Um, green beans are another really easy to grow crop. I will warn you that if you don't have good fencing, rabbits love green bean plants. Uh, and then tomatoes and peppers, we've talked about a little bit. 
those are really easy to grow. For me personally, I can't get a ton of peppers. I don't know what it is, but tomatoes for me are easy. Did you want to add anything about those easy to grow veggies, Ajay? No, I think, uh, I think uh, it's pretty good. With the zucchini, uh, Susan, you know, since it's in the cucurbit family, uh, there are many insects that love the, <laughs> the plants like squash and zucchini. Uh, and like, for example, you know, we have the squash bug, that could be a problem. There is a squash wine borer that actually bores near the stem, uh, near the base of the stem, you know, near the soil. And uh, that, that is a big problem. And oftentimes what you see is that your plant is suddenly become, is drooping. And if you look near the base of the plant, you see a whole squash wine borer, squash wine borer has got in. So uh, keep an eye, a scout in your garden to look for these pests especially for tomatoes and peppers, you know of these horn worms, the giant horn worms that can just devastate the plant within like few days. So uh, after planting, do engage by making sure you walk through the plots rec on a regular basis and scout them for insects. Uh, and and uh, just to add in addition to light, please make sure that wherever you plant, it's a well-drained soil. Because oftentimes, you know, if it's an area where water is standing, you're already putting your plants on the back foot. So for all vegetables, well-drained soil is essential. Yeah, and I see we got this question about the bugs on zucchini and um, Ajay, you're totally right. I had a huge squash bug infestation and I feel like every year I learn more about them. The IPM ISU Extension Crops team has an awesome video about squash bugs. And one of the things that they recommended is grab a board and put it next to the plant. And at night, the squash bugs will go underneath that board and then um, they'll gather there. And so destroying those adults is really important. And I just was not on top of it last year. Any other squash bug tips for getting rid of those pesky ones? Yeah, there are some organic insecticides also available that can be used. Uh, that, that will be helpful uh, to, to take care of the bugs. But again, the main thing is scouting. You need to make sure you act on it as soon as you see the pest. Yeah, and you'll see the adults walking around. They've kind of got like a shield-shaped um, body. And then the eggs will be on the underside of those zucchini or summer squash leaves. Correct. And the Sometimes eggs, on the stem, too. And the eggs would look, eggs would be like orangish in color. And they are laid in a group. Like you'll see a number of eggs together in a cluster. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, share some photos in a little bit <laughs> about those beautiful bugs that I love to squish. So next, we we're just going to talk about bedding plants. And these things also uh, are useful for vegetables. So when you're selecting plants, go back to what Ajay was saying about looking for white roots. So when if you go to a store and buy some plants, it's okay to pull them out of the container. Uh, you don't want roots that have been circling around for a really, really long time. And you definitely want roots that are pale in color. And then one thing that most people might not know about is hardening, hardening off, which is basically getting plants acclimatized, getting them used to being outdoors before you shock them by planting them outside. And this is particularly important to me if you're growing transplants at home, because you might think like, oh, my warm kitchen, that's 70 degrees. I can just plant them outside. Um, but you need to get them used to going in and out. Uh, and so when you're hardening off, think about that you don't want them exposed to too much wind. You don't want them exposed to too much sun. And so it might be like a part shade situation and that you're bringing them in at night. What did I miss there, Ajay? For hardening yeah, no, off I the think, plants. Uh, that, yeah, what we want to do is just get them used to the, te the environment outside because so far they have been pampered inside with a nice constant temperature and light. Now they need to get used to some of the fluctuation in the temperature, some, some uh, breeze and wind. And once your plants are, 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 you know, are sturdier, you can even leave them outside. As long as they're in a protected area, they should not be completely exposed to sun or cold. Uh, so some kind of a lath house or a shaded area close to your, in your, uh, on your deck or your backyard, that will help. 
Yeah. And then when it comes to planting, uh, choose to plant after our, our last chance of frost, depending on the crops. Um, and, and think about, um, putting them into the soil and making sure that that plant, you know, is at the soil line. And I don't know if you want to snatch one of those tomato transplants again, Ajay. So one thing that I've learned is that tomato, tomato plants are one of the plants that you can actually plant fairly deep. And so what I would do if I had that transplant that Ajay's got in his hands is I would um, kind of trim off a couple of those lower leaves. And then there, you can maybe see there's these tiny little hairs along the stem. And so you can, you want to plant them deeper because those, those little, um, the, ha the hairs on the stem are going to form roots. So those are just thing, a few things about once you've got those plants and you want to get them incorporated into the garden. And if you want to get creative, there's all sorts of containers that you can use. Um, you do want to consider container size. Again, these plants are going to be big and their roots are also going to be big. And so you want to make sure you've got a container size that's big enough for it. And we do have a publication that we'll share that talks about the, the width of the diameter of that container, making sure it's big enough. And then going back to the meat growing medium, my guess is that you could probably use a soilless mix um, in a container and that you'll just have to watch and make sure that when we get into these hot, dry <laughs> Iowa summers, that it doesn't dry out because those soilless mixes can go dry really fast. And one of the tips to uh, avoid that is adding a little bit of compost in those mixes. So again, good quality compost so that will hold more moisture and uh, not let the media dry off because Susan is very correct. I mean, if you don't water them for an extended period of time, they become so dry that they become hydrophobic, which means as soon as you water, everything comes out from the bottom. So adding compost will help. Yeah. And then in terms of crop selection, you can think about locations. So for example, maybe you have a patio that doesn't get Southern light. Um, maybe you wanna try crops like peas in a container there or kale, things that don't need as much light. And then make it convenient so that it is easy for you to water when, um, when, when you do need to water. And then Ajay touched a bit about fertilization to help those plants out which plants and containers uh, are usually benefiting from some fertilization, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. They need those nutrients to grow. I mean, the major the macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, uh, those are required. And the, the soilless mix does have a starter charge to it, which means there is some nutrients already in there. Uh, but after three, four weeks, that's gone. And that's where, you know, you need to start applying uh, fertilizers. Cool, and then next, I wanted to talk a little bit about pollinators. So we all know that pollinator populations are in decline over the past two decades. Um, you've probably noticed this and you've seen a lot of great resources for gardening for pollinators. So we, our crops need pollination. So for example, bees help pollinate things like pumpkins, zucchini, and cucumbers. And so if you decide to grow some of those plants, you're also providing, uh, the bees are helping you out by doing some pollination and you're helping out pollinators because you're giving them sources of nectar and pollen. Uh, and then a few more nectar plants that I personally have all three of these in my vegetable garden. Basil is great, zinnias are great, borage, cosmos. There are lots of plants that you could add to your garden to help those pollinators out so that they don't just have a single diet of all I eat is, is, is pollen and nectar from cucumber flowers, but giving them a bigger diet. And then also remember, so folks know about host plants, that butterflies can only lay their eggs on specific plants and that once those eggs hatch and those caterpillars start growing, they can only eat one type of food. And dill and parsley are host plants for the swallowtail butterfly. So that's the caterpillar that you see in this upper picture, munching away at your dill. And 
uh, Sunflower is the host plant for Painted Lady and Silvery Checker Spot. And uh, aren't, aren't uh, our brassicas, our coal crops, aren't they a host plant for some butterflies too, Ajay? Um, I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of any specific, you know, uh, insect that will go and uh, we know that uh, there are insect pests <laughs> that love to eat uh, our cauliflower and cabbage. You know, one of them is the looper, cabbage looper. Right. Uh, then we have the imported cabbage worm. They love to eat the cabbage foliage or the cauliflower or the broccoli foliage. So uh, those are pests and, and we need to treat. Otherwise, you know, you'll see those holes in the leaves. And that's because of those loopers and the imported cabbage worm. And you yeah. can easily, easily control them by, you know, organic uh, insecticide called Dipel, which is uh, a bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacterium and that takes care of them. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes we like it when our plants are a host plant for <laughs> these butterflies and sometimes we don't like it. But maybe you can plant some extra parsley, extra dill um, for those swallowtail butterflies to take over. And then I just wanted to stop these slides um, by just encouraging people to become a part of the Iowa Master Gardener Volunteer Program. We have a big change this year that we're offering the Master Gardener training as an online asynchronous course. So that means that you get to do the work on your own time. It's gonna be happening August through November. And then after you finish that course, you start volunteering in your community. So that first year, you do 40 volunteer hours in your community. And then if you're really interested in the Master Gardener training, but you don't want to volunteer, or maybe this is for professional reasons, you would do the pro-hort option. So the Master Gardener training for the people who plan to volunteer is $195. And for pro-hort, it's $550. So that's just my shameless plug. I'm really excited about the Master Gardener training starting this fall. And these are our resources. Um, we, Ajay and I both uh, use these resources a lot. We've got the Horticulture and Home Pest News. A few of the articles that you're seeing today are from there. Those are really fantastic articles and that website, I search it every day to find new things. Um, last summer, we did a, a series called Sow, Grow, Eat, and Keep. So check that out to see some basic vegetable gardening ideas and videos. We have the Extension Store, which is an online database of awesome publications that folks like Ajay have created about how to choose or grow vegetables. And then we've also got the Master Gardener Volunteer website where I also like to share information. So I think with that, we're gonna start taking some questions. Yes, and we have had some come in and I have been typing furiously to share in our um, comment section links. And I've got a few more to still add to so much of what you've talked about. So for those of you watching now, um, you know, scroll through there and see if any of those uh, cover some topics you want to learn more about. Or if you're watching after the live's over, um, you're going to find a lot of uh, resources there. I like the fact that that our specialists with extension, they put out materials in like every format you could want. There's videos, there's like shorter blog, press release type things, or there's larger, longer documents and some of those awesome publications that have pictures. So that's very exciting. All right, so some questions. Uh, we answered a few, so let me scroll down. Um, here, let's see this one. So we don't have to worry about using full strength fertilizer and burnout on seedlings. I'm using a half strength on my onions. I think that's okay. Uh, always uh, make sure you read the label of the fertilizer. Mm -hmm. How much are they asking you to apply? Don't over apply because yeah, there is a chance of seedlings uh, uh, being burnt. But if you follow those recommendations which are on the on the box, uh, you won't have any issues uh, with the seedlings being damaged. Perfect. All right. Anything to add there, Susan? Uh, so for starting seeds indoors, what lighting do you recommend? You did talk a little bit about this, so let's just recap it. So does UV, blue, pink lighting work for seed starting or is that more for maintaining your indoor plants? 
So, so there is a whole you know plethora of uh, research ongoing right now in terms of uh, high efficiency lighting. Uh, so you will hear about lights, for example, the uh, you know the uh, uh, high pressure sodium lamp. We have the LEDs uh, that are uh, very much in discussion. And with the LEDs, uh, you will see that they are primarily using two wavelengths of light. One is red, the other is blue. There is some white in there as well. So uh, research has shown that red and blue uh, provide the maximum amount of growth because photosynthesis happens, the, the efficiency of photosynthesis is higher in the red and blue light. But that doesn't mean that you can use only red or only blue. So there has to be a, a, a blend of red and blue uh, in there. And the white light, uh, which is added with the red and blue, is that it's kind of, it contains all the intensities, you know, the photosynthetically active radiation, PAR, that's what we call them. So the white light will have all the, all the uh, right wavelengths. So as long as you have, you know, a fluorescent lamp or a tube, uh, which is white light, that will be great. Uh, if, if you're using grow lights, there are some companies that will sell these LEDs with the red, blue, and the white. That's also fine. But make sure you keep them closer to the plant because these, these lights, they don't produce any heat or produce less heat. They need to be closer so the plants can make use of all the photons. All right. Um, if you've got leftover seeds, can you store those for the following year or years? Good question. And I think we all have this dilemma, right? At the end of the season, oh, I have 100 seeds left or 50 seeds or maybe a pack left, which I never opened. So mm -hmm. yes, you can use them the next year. They, uh, as long as you store them properly, I would just put them in an airtight container and uh, try to put it in a room. You know, if it's a, in, in a cellar downstairs or, uh, or if that's not available, you can put in your regular drawer uh, room temperature, you know, 70 degree, that's fine, as long as it's an airtight container. We have used seeds which are like two years old. It's still okay. Uh, what you don't want is moisture to get in there or high humidity because of which molds will, mold will start growing. So airtight container, uh, a steady temperature, uh, you can store it for uh, at least one or two years. I'm picturing myself um, doing that and then forgetting where I stored them. So <laughs> I... <laughs> I'm like opening a random drawer and being like, oh. Um, and uh, Susan reminded me of this great resource uh, that gives some kind of FAQ information on storing seeds. And I just put that in the comments as well. All right. Um, how do I get rid of bugs on zucchini? And oh, uh, we, we did that one. Um, my apologies. Okay. Wonderful to see. So there, thank you. You're excited about the content. Um, I'm thinking as if I'm the one doing the uh, research. Um, so for reference, do you need certain types of light? Um, you talked a little bit about this, but then um, as well with aquasca aquascaping, uh, fish aquarium supplies, hydroponics. Ooh, this is a whole new <laughs> offshoot now. No, that's good for, thanks Benjamin uh, for the reference there. Uh, yeah, the garden stores will carry different types of light. Obviously, the aquarium folks, they need light when I mean, they use it for fish tanks and also, yeah, you can use uh, uh, different types and you can buy them from different places. So, so thanks, thanks for the reference. Yeah, and aquaponics, I feel like I've heard growing interest in that over the last few years. So that's interesting as well. Okay, um, some problems with Colorado potato beetles. Any suggestions? They are the number one pest when it comes to potatoes. Uh, and uh, they will overwinter in Iowa. So that's for sure. Uh, so uh, one of the things uh, we recommend is make sure you rotate your crops, which means don't plant potato in the same spot in the garden every year, or even the crops from the same family. For example, tomatoes, peppers, they're all in the solanaceous family, eggplant. So uh, crop rotation uh, is the uh, highly you know, suggested uh, way, uh, you know, recommendation. Uh, you can use some insecticides, some pyrethroids are available, uh, which can be sprayed. But with pota Colorado potato beetle, uh, there has been instances where these insects have uh, shown resistance to some of these commonly used insecticides. So 
uh, be careful, you know, not if you're using insecticides, don't use the same insecticide again and again because they will generate resistance. So as of now, I mean, the best solution is to rotate your crop and, and not plant uh, potatoes in the same spot. And I have to say, I'm really sad because this is the year that I'm going to pull that family out of my garden. And so I'm really hoping that it's not a great tomato year <laughs> because, yeah, I'm not going to grow any of the Solanaceae this year. So okay. an interesting fact, uh, there was a research that came from, uh, I think, uh, uh, either from Utah, uh, where they were, uh, or Oregon, that talked about uh, these overwintered uh, Colorado potato beetles, what they typically do is in the spring, they come out of the soil and the generation, the initial generation cannot fly. So they have to walk to their host. So this research paper said that the, the magic distance which you have to keep your plot away from where it was the past year was 680 feet. <laughs> I don't know oh my how, gosh. That, how they came up with that. But that was the magic number, 680 feet from, from the previous year's plot, because these beetles apparently cannot walk more than that, and they die. <laughs> How many beetle steps is 680 feet? That's what I want to know. One meter, one meter is three feet, so about 300, you know, 200 meters away from there, or... <laughs> so how many steps did the beetles have to make to get yeah, that far? <laughs> My goodness, what a track for them. But I guess if you got to get to the host, you got to get to the host. Okay. Um, so the good news, though, is for this question is it's you're not alone. The potato beetles, you're not alone in that. Uh, and crop rotation is really important for other diseases and pests, too. So the more that people can rotate their crops, the better. better. And, and we did put a source in the comments about that as well. If you don't have many potato plants, you can always pick them from the plants as well. That's another way you know, to, to keep them. Open. Yeah. Okay. Best way to control blossom rot on container grown tomatoes. Okay. Uh, a very common problem in container grown tomatoes. That is because uh, Susan had mentioned that the containers dry very quickly because it, these are soilless media, which don't hold too much of water. Uh, and one remedy is to make sure you add compost to the medium, like the soilless mix. So that helps to hold on more water for an extended period of time. Uh, that way, uh, the media do doesn't dry. Uh, calcium moves into the plant and ultimately into the fruit when plants take up water. So it moves with water. So if you have a container grown tomato, which dries and then you water and then you don't water for a long time and again completely dries. So it interrupts with the flow of calcium. And that is why you see blossom and rot. So the, uh, the approach behind is to make sure that the media is always moist and doesn't dry down uh, for an extended period of time. So if you're watering every week, keep up with that. You want fluctu fluctuations in moisture, not like trough and you know hill. You want slight fluctuations uh, in watering. So make sure you water regularly. Also calcium, because maybe there's not enough calcium in the medium. So uh, uh, I have seen uh, folks might even crush the eggshells and they mm -hmm. add it to the medium. That's fine. Make sure you crush them well because you need to get that calcium out. Uh, and you can also apply some calcium fertilizer uh, in the beginning itself, in the medium, so that there is enough steady supply of calcium to the plant. I feel like the list of vitamins and minerals plants need, um, like I, I need them as well. <laughs> like we have something in common. Um, <laughs> I'll just write that list out and then match it for my own. All right. So I think we're kind of nearing the end of questions. And again, I, um, the amount of information that is now available to you all in the comments uh, through, again, some are videos, some are really quick little you know, here's the question, here's the answer. And some are larger publications that are really gonna be in depth, give you a lot of information. There's some great graphics uh, on when to plant your gardens. Um, and talk, we 
put information in there about transplanting as well. Um, again, if you're watching this later after the live's over, still throw your questions in the comments um, and I will make sure that our specialists receive that. You also have access to Susan and Ajay through their emails. Um, here's also some pages, some social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, where you can follow along for our specialists. Susan manages a couple of those. Um, as well. So yeah, we we want to meet you guys where you're at. Um, and I think we've got more to come where we get Ajay in the field. Maybe that's like a new series where we, where's Ajay today? <laughs> but next time I'm joining you because Susan and I, we're not doing this, this background. We want the greenhouse background. All right. Well, we covered a lot today. Thank you guys so much for bringing all of this great information. Really practical too. I feel like as I still learn my gardening information. Um, all of this is, these are things that I feel I can, can put into practice right away. And I think that um, you'll see that like, it's super fun. Like we love, we love plants so much. <laughs> and so it's really fun to get to meet other people and hear their questions. Cause like, it's just exciting. Look at those green plants behind Ajay. <laughs> you know, the, my kids the other day, the, the grass is like it's not, I wouldn't even call it green in our yard right now, but compared to what it was, it's green. Um, and they were so excited to see that. Um, I'm gonna put uh, one of the links that share the Iowa Master Gardener program. That is, um, that link is in the chat right now. Click over there, get to get to see a little bit more. Um, like Susan did get, she said a shameless plug, but I, there's no shame in that. Master Gardeners is such a phenomenal program um, all throughout Iowa. There's just people passionate about serving their community in many ways. And it's not all just about gardening. There's so much more, pollinators, conservation, prairie, all these things. Really, really a lot of information. You can learn more and you can connect with other people that have some common interests. Um, that you might also have. So um, yeah, we're getting a few thank yous in the comments. Thanking you guys for joining us for your insight. Um, and I, I know you guys are passionate about this. Um, so thank you for bringing that passion to us. Yeah, thank right. you, Leah. Thank yeah, you. let's throw their, um, throwing your guys' email up one more time, making sure that everybody has access to that. And again, you can always ask comments or message us, uh, whatever, get, get in contact and let us know what you wanna hear more about. So far, I'm thinking we need to get a somebody from our insect pest management team on here because we had a lot of we had a lot of buggy questions. So pollinators. Oh, OK. Yeah, we can talk pollinators any day. All right. Well, it is Friday. Go outside if you can and have a really, really good weekend Hopefully in outside in the dirt, maybe. And Susan, tell the dog hi. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.